Welcome to Good Christophian Talks. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. And I'm Brian. Thank you for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help us get the Bible in our daily newsfeed. We post a new episode at the start of each week with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to listen to. And now, let's talk more about this week's talk. Hello and welcome to back to another talk this week. Uh, for this week, we're listening to an exhortation that was given by Brother Antonio Howell Jr. at the Austin Leander Ecclesia back in 2010. Brother Antonio is giving an exhortation on the subject of making the best use of our time. And I, I really enjoyed this exhortation. It was recommended as one somebody had found and actually really enjoyed and thought it would be worth sharing. And in his exhortation, as the, the title kind of gives away, Brother Antonio is talking about how to make best use of our time. And he draws a lot of different examples, both scriptural and practical. And what I really enjoyed about Antonio's style of exhorting is his exhortation could just as much be an exhortation being given on a Sunday morning as it would be having a talk with you about life uh, going on around there uh, and what's going on in his life. And uh, I just appreciate it as a, a good sense of humor that you can enjoy. Um, there's a couple times in the exhortation where uh, he cracks a joke well enough that you hear the audience laugh. What I mostly appreciated was it was a good reminder of how to best use the time that we have. He gives some examples of people who sometimes are told exactly how much time they have left and how they're able to put so much better use to it when they have a finite goal uh, stretched out in front of them. In a way, we all have the same finite goal, but it's not as definitive as somebody saying you have however many weeks or months or years left. But we know that the return of Christ is coming. We know it's coming soon. You can look at the world around us and, and see more and more signs that seem to be pointing to it. The whole point of his exhortation is making sure that not only are we waiting for that day to come, but also making sure to make best use of the time that we have so that when that time comes, we are ready so that we can be, uh, as he gave in one of his examples, be like the disciples who seemingly dropped everything and just went with Christ. And one of the points that he makes is in order for them to be ready to just pick up and go when Christ called them is that they had to be preparing themselves and being ready for that type of a calling before they were called. They may not have known exactly how that was going to happen, but they knew it was coming. A really good encouraging exhortation, a good call of action, and a good reminder to make the best use of the time that we have. And sometimes, especially right now, we sometimes seem to have more time on our hands than we might otherwise think, so it was a good reminder. As always, please continue to send in recommendations. We really live on those. We are glad to have uh, Brian join. Thank you for everybody who sent words in to, to welcome him as he joins us as the third host. We hope you enjoy this talk and many others to come in the coming year. So with that, I will turn it over to our brother Antonio Howell Jr. for his exhortation, Making the Best Use of Our Time. So a teacher walks into the classroom, first day of class, eager ninth graders are looking around, and he looks at them and asks one question, how much time do we have? As you might expect, all the kids look around, look at the clock, but he knew this was going to happen, and he expected this response, so he tells them, the answer to that question won't be found by staring at the clock. So how much time do we have? That's the first question i like for us to try to answer today. And I'd like us to think about it for a little bit. The second question is, um, at what time will Christ return? And the third question I'd like to answer this morning is, what is the best use of our time? Good morning, brothers and sisters and young people. It's a pleasure for me to bring to you today a word of exhortation. Um, it's uh, indeed an honor. I thank you very much. Although, after this exhortation, you might decide you don't want me to talk anymore. <laughs> this product is meant for educational purposes only. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a blessing that has not come to that, right? Uh, we're free here to talk uh, in the exhortation platform about whatever we think needs to be conveyed. 
Uh, we don't have to think about covering our backs. So we're free to share, you know, our message about the Lord and his love for us without any worry about legalizing and, and, and bickering. And, and it's a place of dialogue because I speak and without you speaking anything, you're also dialoguing with me because I can feel you saying yes or nodding your head. So it's a dialogue. And it, it, it's a dialogue for us to try to look for the truth. And, and if it's done right, okay, um, it's great. It's great. Um, and, and if you come up here and you feel there's something you need to correct, you can do that as long as you do it with love and humility. And, and at the end, the purpose is to bring us um, closer to God and his glory. So exhorting, as I was saying before, is uh, it's, it's a difficult task. Um, it's not something that, um, that, that comes easily, at least not to me. Um, but there's something about feeling that deadline on top of you and, and, and knowing that it's your turn to make you actually sit down and start to put different priorities and things in your life. Okay. And, and that's exactly what I want to talk about. I want to talk to you about this, this ability of, of taking the things, taking the time to do the things that need to be done. Um, so that because once, once you have done it, okay, and you fulfill that role, it, it feels great. Um, the accomplishment of, of actually, um, coming up in your mind saying, okay, I got to come up with something that, that everybody already knows. But I have to say it in a different way and have to bring it to them in a way that's going to be uplifting and useful. That's a heavy, heavy burden, but it can be done. And once it's accomplished, the benefit that you get by doing it is so great. You wonder why you don't do this every day. But at least I, I don't. Um, I feel like I want to and I have the intentions to, but not until I have that deadline. I don't do anything. And, and. And that's what I want to exhort about, about not waiting too long, taking the time to do what needs to be done before it's too late. So um, how much time do we have? Not a lot. That's the answer. We don't have a lot of time. Um, the, um, the disciples... Um, we know, all know who they are. Simon, Peter, Andrew, all of them um, were working, right? And not much is said about them until actually they're presented during the uh, um, the Gospels. Uh, but they had to have a life before, and they had to have, in my opinion, something that would prepare them in order to answer the call of the Lord when he made it to them. Okay? And... Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 says, And Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, Paul, Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. See, they were doing their work, right? They were busy doing the things that they do every day to support themselves and their family. Matthew 4, verse 19, And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straight away left their nets and followed him. And going from thence, he saw other two, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I would follow a complete stranger that came up to me and said, follow me, right? Especially if I'm working, right? And I don't think that I would leave a family member in order to go follow someone. However, if my wife told me, follow me, yes, <laughs> I would. If my father came up to me and said, follow me, I would. If my mother came up to me and said, follow me, I could be the middle of an operation. I would <laughs> drop what I'm doing and go follow. What's the difference? Think about it. Now, 
the rich man um, that we read about in Matthew 19, he, he's very um, um, illo- illustrative of uh, what the point I'm trying to make here. Um, it, our, we can read from Matthew 19. Um, let's see. And Matthew 19, verse 60, And behold, one came and said unto him, God, Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? This is the rich young man, right? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which, Jesus said, uh, he said unto him, which, Jesus said, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witnesses, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciple, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter in the kingdom of heaven. For it's easier uh, and again, I say unto you, for it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. The reason was that the rich man, although he had done every other commandment that Jesus said that he should do, the most important one, the most important one, he was lacking. Okay? And because he was lacking in that most important thing, he missed out about being uh, part of the kingdom. Now, I don't know about you, but um, that's pretty difficult. I mean, if this was a test, you know, and you got 20 right and one you missed, you know, you did pretty good, right? Right? But not here. The most important thing is the most important thing. And the most important thing is the thing that if it lacks, nothing else matters. Okay? Are we the rich young man? Well, the United States per capita does pretty good. As far as our uh, gross domestic product versus compared to all the rest of the world, we're on the top of the list. Just on that, um, this is the same uh, place that brought us the iPod, Internet, Google, and we, you know, no number of things that has been very lucrative, okay? On the uh, list of International Monetary Fund, as far as gross domestic product, U.S. is number one. List uh, The list by the World Bank. U.S. is number one. The CIA World Factbook, the U.S. is number one. Second in a few lists only to the European Union, which is, you know, what it is. And uh, (laughs) so second to that, U.S. is number one. So are we the rich nation? Are we the rich young man? Should we be guarding ourselves that we don't fall in love? And I said it, fall in love with something that's um, other than uh, God and his plan for us. Because um, if we do, then we'll be guilty like he was and very likely not be a part of the kingdom. So it's something that we have to watch. Um, two years, uh, three years ago, two and a half, September 18, 2007, a computer science professor named Randy Posh stepped in front of a classroom at Carnegie Mellon University and delivered a lecture. Now, this lecture was just like any other lecture, except for the fact that uh, Dr. Posh had metastatic pancreatic cancer. 
meaning that the cancer would spread to other organs. And pancreatic cancer is one of the deadly ones. He had just a few months to live. And during this lecture, he shared with the audience basically his life, okay? He talked about the things he did and the things that he loved to do. And all in, it was all entertaining, nice recap. And as of Wednesday of last week, had over 10 million hits on YouTube. A sensation. He did a, um, what's her name? Um, he did several um, news uh, interviews, uh, one of them with Diane Sawyer, um, CNN. He had a book that went bestseller. And um, after the doctor, at the time of the lecture, doctors had given him five more months to live. <coughs> And um, he actually outlived that. He lived 10 months after and died at the age of 47. So how much time do we have? Not a lot. But uh, just a twinkling in an eye. Now, we might not have um, metastatic cancer, um, but we don't know, you know, what might happen tomorrow. Um, I'm sure the people... Um, before September 12th, the people in Haiti didn't think that, you know, they were going to be hit with such a great devastation as they were. And they were. And their time for a lot of them was cut short. So how much time do we have? The answer has to be not a lot. Okay? Um, Start to Matthew chapter 16. And I want us to think about Dr. Posh, Randy Posh. I'm not sure I'm saying it right. P-A-U-S-C-H, Posh. Okay. Um, he had a very entertaining life. He, he became a, a Disney engineer or whatever, or Imagineer. And um, he founded this, uh, he created this computer program that would teach kids how to, how to, um, um, program code as a game and he he says this is going to be his legacy for his children and this and that very very nice matthew 16 verse 24 then said jesus unto his disciples if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me matthew 16 verse 25 for whosoever will save his life shall lose it and whosoever loses life for my sake shall find it. And this is the point, the following verse. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. All right? And we know we can't win salvation, but we're going to be accounted for our works, okay? There are things that we need to be doing in order to gain where we want to go. And it's better to be doing the right things that are going to get us there than spend a lot of time doing all kinds of things that's great and nice and pretty and, you know, but when your time comes and you fall asleep, that's it. You're out of time. So, like I said before, Dr. Posh lived longer than the doctors predicted. Uh, but the answer is still the same. We don't have a lot of time. How much time do we have? Not a lot of time. Now, the second question. When will Jesus Christ return? Or what time will Jesus Christ return? It's a play on words. Trust me. It'll make sense later. What time will Jesus Christ return? Now, every year since Christ's ascension uh, to the heaven until today, over 2,000 years, um, people have tried to discern when Christ will return. And they always arrive at the same time. Anywhere in history that some people have tried, right at the same time, it's soon. <laughs> Five till. 
or my brother said, the time of crash insurance is always 11.55. <laughs> you know, it's always just about to happen. And if you read the Bible and you read about what's going on, you read about the latter times, you would hear of wars, rumors of wars, of uh, earthquakes in diverse places, um, floods, soon. So you know it's soon. But more importantly, I think, is that we know it's going to happen. That's the more important thing. A lot of people get tied up in trying to figure out when. doesn't matter when. We know that we don't have a lot of time. So we might as well spend the time that we have doing the things that we need to do in order to reach there. Because after we fall asleep, then we wake up, boom, he's there, right? And we're being judged. Okay? More important that knowing when he returns is the fact that he will return. And also important is that when he returns, guess what? Time's up. Can't do anything else. Can't start working then. Can't start doing then. We got to be doing now. The road to perdition is paved with good intentions. We can't be intending to do. We can't be wanting to do. You know, I was fixing to do. I heard that one. All right. <laughs> is what have you done? Now, there is a, um, I heard this once. I don't remember where, but it was this older lady talking to young girls about um, matters of the heart. And this young lady said to them, uh, if you, um, as, as far as boys is concerned, okay, ignore everything they say and listen to what they do. And, you know, I think that's pretty good, pretty good advice, because a lot of people can talk up a lot of things, but at the end, what you do is really what is in you. And it's very difficult. Um, um, to make a mistake once you follow that, okay? Um, so, how do we best use our time? All right. Well, it is two, this is a two-parter, okay? First, I want to, uh, want to turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 36. This part, verse 35. Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting me and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second one is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. Very important, okay? Very, very important point. Because what Jesus is doing here is taking all this that can be sometimes confusing, all this that can sometimes be bewildering, the word, the truth, and he's condensing it for you into two commandments. And then you realize, okay, if you've been spending the time, you realize at least this is what came to me, is that the story, the message, the whole creation is a love story, okay? God loves us first, created us. Now, he respects us to, in turn, love him back. And when you love someone, you do things to please them. All right? So that's what we're supposed to do. Love, it's a love story. At the end, it's a big love story. Okay? So um, when we think about it in that light, okay, when we think about it in that way, then things start to make sense. We have somewhere to um, stand on. We have a place where um, 
from which we have a venue, we can see the forest from the trees and not get confused with the details. The story is, the point is, for the best use of our time, is doing the things that we need to do in order to fall in love and stay in love with God. Now, I remember somebody, I think it was by our brother Barry, talked about how is it that he's asking us to love when you can't really pick who you fall in love with? You know, it's like a commandment, but, you know, it's not like I can't like on purpose just boom, I'm going to love you. You know, you, you, you can't. You can't. It, you're not a robot, you know. And um, but the, I think the answer is that you have to learn to love. You have to learn to love. You have to do the things that need to be done in order for you to fall in love. How do you fall in love? Well, you meet somebody and you talk and they think you look cool and, you know, <laughs> you think they look pretty cool. And, and, and all they got to do is just look at you and your heart starts to pitter patter and, and, and they smile at you and you're about to just pass out, you know, and, and, uh, and then you have things in common. And, you know, you write a little note, and all the books you wrote for me, and you write a note back, uh, and then you fall in love, right? But you got to spend the time to fall in love. You got to be together to fall in love. That's how you do it. Okay? So, um, Matthew 25, verse 14. Matthew 25, verse 14. Uh, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, and to every man according to several abilities, straight away took his journey. Then he, had rec- then he that received the five talents traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that received two also gained another two. But he that received one went and digged in earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord uh, of those servants cometh and reckoned with them, so that he had, so that he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well, thou dost. Good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. <coughs> he also that received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents besides them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been unfaithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. And he just gave him back his same talent. His Lord answered unto him, said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sow not. And gather where I have not strawed, thou hast therefore to put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming, I should have received my own wit usury. That therefore the talent from him, take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which had ten talents. For unto every one that had shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But for him that had not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant unto darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I wanted to read this whole thing because a, there's an important lesson here. Okay. Number one is clear. You got to use your time to do so that you can do and produce your talents. Okay. It's not just about thinking about it. It's about doing. Well, that's clear. But there's something um, here. That's hidden, and it's very, very important, in my opinion. And see if you share the same thought. Um, 
Wisdom is wisdom, okay? The same God that created heaven and earth, created you, created the, the, the laws of physics. He created the laws that hang the moon. He created the laws that hang the, the sun. And all the things that we see around you that scientists and everybody else tried to discover was already created and put in place by God. So it all has to make sense, okay? And when you utilize wisdom, no matter who you are, when you utilize it, you benefit from it because it's God's law. It's wisdom. Okay? <clears throat> we have in our hand God's love letter to us, right? But it's also replete with words of wisdom. Okay? And it's a special type of wisdom. A wisdom that has endured ages. Ages and ages. Time has a way of picking out things that are not true from things that are true. For a while, we thought the hurt was flat. And guess what? We were wrong. But we could only discover that with time, okay? There was a lot of things that were thought of before that later came and was, turns out that were not true, but not God's wisdom. God's wisdom is true back then and it's true now. Matter of fact, the fact that it's here with us is a testament of how true it is. Before the printing press, before people could write, you have to transmit things by word of mouth. Somebody had to learn it and had to say it to other people, and they had to learn it and pass it on. So when that's the case, you don't waste your time learning things that are not true because you don't want to be learning things that are garbage. After, you know, people started writing, you started etching things into stone, you know, well, if you're going to be working every single letter, you know, getting it just right, you know, kind of like that copy of that um, prayer that's over there. I don't think it's there anymore, is it? The one on the way to the kitchen. Somebody had to draw every one of those letters, you know, and had to be just right. OK, when you're doing that kind of work, you're not writing down things that are not important. OK, you're writing down things that are true, that are matter that have been passed down to you and that, you know, are true. You don't waste time. It's only today with the Internet and everything. Everybody can blog and write about everything that you have all this confusion nowadays. But this has been around for a long time. Matter of fact, the book of Proverbs, probably around over 4,000 years. You know, how many things can you hold in your hands that's 4,000 years old and not have to pay for it? <laughs> huh? But that's what we have here. OK, a wisdom that's been distilled with time. And given to us for our benefit. But we have to search it. We have to look it out. Okay? So, um, one of the things that I, um, I have uh, noticed or, uh, um, let's see, how should I put that? One of the things I studied a long time ago was about this principle called um, the Pareto Law or Pareto Principle. It has to do with the unequal distribution of wealth. And it was an Italian economist who devised or taught or saw or noticed that the people who were really, really wealthy were so much more wealthy than everybody else that 20% of the wealthiest people was wealthier than the other 80% who weren't as wealthy. So there was an unequal distribution of wealth. And this has been exposed in different ways. It comes to us today as something called the 80-20 rule. All right. The 80-20 rule is very simple. It says for businessmen, it's always business oriented. Um, and it says that 80% um, of the results in business come from 20% of the workers. That means that 80% of the workers are not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> and 20% of them are. And that applies not just in business, in all areas of your life. You probably spend 80% of your time on 20% of your house. You probably sit in the same area of the living room. You probably sleep in the same area in the bedroom, the same side. You probably wear a certain number of clothing 80% of the time, more than you wear anything else. You probably wear the same thing. Okay? And you can take this principle and go all over it. Now, don't get... Don't get caught up in the 80-20 part. It doesn't always 80-20. It could be 95, you know, 95-5, 90-10, you know, but it's disproportionate as far as its level of importance, at least to you, and the results. And what scientists 
or businessmen have started to figure out is that what we need to do is figure out who these 20% productive people are and give them more responsibility or allow them to do their job easier. And that in turn will create greater prosperity, blah, 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 blah. Well, isn't this what just happened today or in this reading? The one who produced 10 was given the extra one. All right. He was given that extra uh, talent to go and invest again. OK. And the only reason I'm illustrating that thing is because of this. This thought is because there are things in our life too, activities that we do every day. And some of them are going to be beneficial to us, useful, bringing us closer to God. And some of them are not. And our job is to figure out which are the ones that are beneficial and do them more, put them more important than others, and don't fall prey to the ones that aren't as important. Everybody wants the 80% benefit, but nobody wants to do the 20% work. Okay? That's just the way it is. Today is the first day of the week. Where are we? Right here. What's most people doing outside? Sleeping doing everything else but being here. Why are we here? Because we know this is important. This is one of those 20% activities. And if you once you once you recognize a 20% activity, you make sure and do that every single time that you can because it's that important. Okay? It's that important. Um Matthew 13 verse 44. Matthew 13 verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. The man which when had found it, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and selleth everything that he hath, and buyeth the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant that seeks goodly pearls, and woe when he found one of such great price, went and sold all he had and bought it. That's how good it is, Okay. That's how good it is. Uh, Paul writes about it, but it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Same idea from Isaiah 64, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither hath the eye seen or God besides thee, what he has prepared for him that waited, waited for him. It's worth it. Whatever you have to do to do that 20% activity and give you the response that you need, which is in the case is doing the things that you need to do to fall in love and stay in love. Fall in love and stay in love. Because puppy love, you know, that's good and everything, but it's so fleeting, okay? Um, you're in love one moment. And you think, oh, I, that is the greatest thing in the world. And then a few days later, boom, it's gone. We have, we are like tape recorders that's constantly taping, okay? And unless we keep doing these activities over and over, we'll forget and we'll fall out of love. And then we'll be in danger like the young man, the young rich man who fell in love with his riches. And then when the time came for him to be called, he did not answer the call. When Jesus Christ came to him and said, do this and follow me, he did. He was not in love or enough in love. He had other things that he loved more. And that's the lesson that I'd like to share with you today. Okay? How much time do we have? Not a lot. When is Christ going to come back? Soon. But when he comes back, time's up. So we got to use our time that we have doing the things that we need to do to fall in love with the Lord and stay in love. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. We hope this talk helped you in your walk. If you would like to hear more, please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review in Apple Podcast or whichever service you are using to help more people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this particular talk, please share it with someone who you think might enjoy it as well. 
For show notes on the talk you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash GCT or check the show notes section of your podcast player. Please share your thoughts on the talk from this week on our Facebook or Instagram pages where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks, on Twitter where we are at GCT underscore podcast, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel where these talks are posted as well. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to our email at goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media accounts. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.